Okay. Um, what I've done is I've put 12 slides together, um, um, a bit about, because I think um, just for people who are out of province, just a bit about what Erin Oak Kids is and who we serve, as well as um, um, I, I put some slides on and kind of how I work within our agency. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm just going to talk about future directions. Um, so I, I was given 15 minutes, and for anyone um, who knows me, 15 minutes is very difficult for me to stay within. <laughs> so I thought if I limited my slides, then I, I could limit um, uh, how long I, and I've got two clocks in front of me. Um, so, uh, John, take the time because we can yeah. learn from you, and we actually only have to just go over that we have a working group meeting, meeting on Friday. So okay. honestly, uh, please go. People will really be interested in what you have to say. Okay, terrific, terrific. Okay, so um, we're a children's treatment center. There's uh, 20, um, from my understanding, throughout the province. Um, um, we're the largest one. Uh, we serve 13,500 families here from 0 to uh, 19 years old. Um, the number is quite inflated because probably about 6,000 of those families are, are early intervention speech and language program. Um, we also have a number of Central West Region provincial programs where um, we do um, uh, hearing screenings and uh, um, uh, some other screenings, but that's about 30,000 babies per year. But it's not all done within Erin Oak. It's done within the community as well, I, 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 throughout the community. Um, the clients we work with have physical, developmental, communication disorders, as well as autism. Um, we serve the regions of Halton and Peel primarily, and then our Central West region um, is for the provincial stuff, uh, which is outside Peel and Halton. We have about 600 staff. Um, to give you an idea, I started in 01 here. We had about 100 staff. So we've gr grown exponentially over the last 10 years. When, when I started here, we had two sites. We now have 10 sites. Um, when I started, we had about a $2 million budget. We now have about a, a 65 to $70 million budget. And our money comes from the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, um, which, which is a fairly new ministry. Um, our core services, they're all listed within the presentation. I don't want to focus too much on them. Um, uh, a lot of autism services, um, communication. Um, a family needs to have a course service or a referral from a family doc to access Erin Oak. Um, a, a lot of this information was taken directly off our website and if you do get a copy of the presentation you can just link into it and it'll take you right to that part of the website. Um, these are our additional services and right on the bottom that transition services is what I'm going to focus on which I think is kind of most important. Um, uh, here we go. So um, what I want to focus on, and I have a slide on, on each area, is um, kind of the way that I'm working throughout the agency. So um, like I said, I, I, I'm in my 13th uh, year here. When I started, there was no transition services. Um, we were small enough at the time um, to be able to uh, provide um, the services that families needed. When I came, um, there was a mandate by the organization to put the discharge age down to 21, and then what happened after a few years, it was put down to the age of 19. Um, so we were looked at as a, a, a complete pediatric service then, um, where we had to look at adult services and what was out there. Um, so uh, the different areas I want to look at is the consultation services that I provide and then the ways that I work within different teams throughout the agency. Um, uh, so through, I, I have a clinic that I do with our nurse. I have a, a clinic that I do with our um, psychoeducational consultant, um, which is a, a hugely growing area. We also have a summer program that we've developed through the model um, through Blurview, which is our independent living program. Um, which is very popular. And then we have a number of youth groups I just want to touch on and then different community involvement. Uh, the first way is um, through myself getting a referral. Primarily the referrals I'm receiving are families who um, have kids who are 12 and up. Um, uh, when I first started I was seeing um, I was seeing clients at the age of 15, 16, 17 and kind of problem solving kind of um, what's out there, 
um, where do you need to connect, and doing an assessment through a checklist and, and whatnot, and making sure that they were connected to different services. Um, I was also having a number of community workshops, uh, so having different service providers come in. Um, we've kind of evolved from there um, because of different partnerships that have happened in the community. A lot of those workshops happen through the local community livings and different organizations. And uh, you'll be able to see that in um, my following slides through the different committees I'm involved with. And those committees have evolved to provide some of those workshops which have alleviated my time so that I can do more um, client direct work. Um, so, but different, I, I've identified the different areas that we look at, financial, post-secondary employment, education, all the different things that the literature talks about. Um, uh, what has become, uh, or what I've seen within my work which has become pivotal is working with the school boards um, and um, looking at placements for um, uh, different clients that I see and making sure they're in the right stream, um, heading within the right um, uh, direction. Um, and then we're looking at what's available based on the profile. Um, uh, we, I also try to link different kids to our youth programs, and that's more for social skills. Our, our programs are quite popular, and when I go to that slide, you, I'll give you an idea of how many uh, uh, youth we have uh, coming. Um, approximately within a year, um, I know the year before this, when we had a consultant do an audit of my position, I was seeing anywhere from 350 to 500 families within a year within my individual consultation practice. Um, uh, we, we have clients who um, are considered medically fragile, and I know every province would um, identify that differently, but when we say medically fragile um, uh, within our um, Ontario provincial identification, I, I would be talking about a, um, an individual who has a developmental disability, who may have a trach, who may have a G-tube, um, who's fairly complex um, within the world of disability and, and moving forwards. What I do um, uh, with those particular clients when they have a lot of medical needs as well as um, uh, community needs going forward, um, I meet with them with our nurse, and we see within a day we see three clients. We spend anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes doing an internally developed checklist, and we call it our um, TPT, so our transition planning tool uh, checklist. Um, originally, when we developed it eight, nine years ago, um, we had uh, um, our OTs do it within our school program, but we we don't provide that service anymore. Um, so, and then what would happen is the OT would pass that back to me and then I would have the family in with all of that information. So now that we don't have that, um, all of the OTs and PTs within the school system, it makes it a little more difficult. Um, however, we know who those complex clients is, uh, are, so we identify them um, in a year. It works out to about, um, I, I would say, probably about 20 clients in a year that we have in. Um, on an average. Um, this clinic is a growing clinic. Um, we have it on the first and the third Thursdays of the month. Um, this is where I work with our psychoeducational consultant. We're looking at profiles of kids. Um, we do a workshop for transitioning into high school. Um, we look at placements within high school, making sure they're in the right stream. Um, and we also have a number of kids who are transitioning to post-secondary. Um, we also have developmental services. We have a new pathway that's been developed. It, it's a new access system, not a new pathway. Um, and it's to link into the community livings. Um, so with the documentation that's needed, we have a number of kids who are considered untestable. And we have our consultant look at them, and he's able to fill a document out so that they're able to access future services. They're able to do that um, at the age of 16. We've been working closely with the school boards out here to make sure that this isn't a drain on our service, um, but we're all working together. Um, and we're trying to get parents to get the documentation um, together earlier so it's easier to um, access those systems. But what we have found is we found a lot of um, students in the wrong streams for whatever reason. Either they haven't been tested internally by the school board um, or they um, uh, they've been put in a life skill stream where they have the ability to do a higher curriculum, 
Um, and and uh, we've seen a number of students become successful by um, having the right accommodations put in place at the school level. Um, um, so I'm, I also do a number of case conferences at schools looking at um, kind of those accommodations based on the profiles that we see here. Um, we see anywhere from, it says 10 to 15 on the slide, but we may see up to 25 clients in a month um, on different days that we fit into our schedules. Um, I wanted to touch on, we have an independent living program. This is where we have 14 youth, up to 14 youth, ages 16 to 19. These are youth who have goals related to employment, education, independent living. Um, they live at Sheridan College. Um, we don't fund this money through our provincial dollars. All this money is fundraised. Um, we also have a partner um, who's an uh, attendance service provider that we provide this program with. Um, and um, it's to give these kids um, or the youth and young adults kind of a, um, a step in the right direction to accessing the adult world. Um, we've started to keep over the last 10 years to keep stats on where they all are. And it's a great success that we've been seeing. Um, there's a lot of research that's going on with Bloorview, and we're involved with that, um, as well as a few other provincial programs. Um, this is kind of the criteria to that program. Um, it would be great if this was ministry funded, but it's a lot of dollars for, um, or I guess you're looking at the bank for the buck. Um, but we look at it as a showcase program, and it always gets funded each year through our um, fundraising dollars. Um, our youth groups, we have a youth advisory committee. Um, this was uh, the pioneer group in the province. It started in 1989. Um, our Youth Advisory Committee has anywhere from 10 to 15 youth. I facilitate that group, and that group helps me plan all of the other different groups that we have happening within the center. Um, we have a mentorship group um, that two social workers run, a very popular group as well. I, we have about 40 mentors that attend that group, um, and they work within our other groups as being mentors for different youth coming through our center. Um, our drop-in happens on the first Tuesday of the month. We get up to 80 to 85 youth at drop-in. It's an informal setting. Um, uh, it's where youth learn the social skills that they need to kind of enter into the adult community. We get kids who are um, really low developmentally, and we have youth who are incredibly uh, bright, who are gifted, um, all different disabilities. Um, a walker and a talker to um, someone in a manual wheelchair. So we get a bit of everything, and it's a great mix. Um, uh, and the kids like it, and if they didn't like it, they wouldn't come. Um, we also have dances that happen at a local community center. We have up to three dances a year. This year we have two. Um, uh, we have them throughout the year. We get anywhere up to 80, 90 kids come. We've had a talent night. Um, these are all different groups that the kids have developed through the Youth Advisory Committee. And as staff, we kind of facilitate it. Um, within my role, um, and my role is changing in the next couple of years, but I've been the primary person who's kind of um, helped facilitate this. But within everything that I'm talking about, this isn't a one-person job. There's a whole whack of people who come into play to make all of these groups happen. Um, and different community agencies as well. Um, for example, our barbecue, we have a couple local groups who come in and help out um, with the barbecue and even donate the funds for it. But we get about uh, 150 um, different people who come to our barbecue, um, our youth barbecue. Um, these are different um, committees I've been involved with just within the last couple years. I, I didn't want to put the last 10 years, but um, I, I just wanted to focus on um, like really quickly on the importance of the committee involvement and the community involvement because it really has alleviated um, some of the work um, that we were doing internally but when we look to the community partners and um, how we could work together it really alleviated a lot of work so that I could see a lot more families um, in my office uh, and free up time and, and also look what's happening within the different areas. So there's a Transitions Advisory Committee that started out of the region of Peel. 
Um, there is probably about 20 different organizations, mostly developmental agencies. Um, but the committee has been instrumental with having a resource fair, with having in-services for parents at different schools within the region. Um, and, and Peel is a real area that wants to work together um, as a region. Um, the region of Halton has just started their committee in the last two years, um, but quite motivated as well. Um, and I'm hoping that, that that committee evolves the same way um, the Region of Peel uh, uh, committee has evolved. Um, as we know through the literature, uh, transportation is really pivotal. So um, for the last 10 years, I've been involved with the Accessibility um, Transportation committee, uh, committee for the Region of Peel. And it's a very progressive system. Um, uh, we even have um, uh, different people with different disabilities. It's not just a paratransit system. So they're looking more at some developmental di um, disabilities um, um, accessing um, transportation as well. Um, so, but transportation, I can say, is not perfect, and probably within any region. Um, however, it, it's really pivotal within the area of transitions, as I'm sure everyone on the phone knows. Um, we have two resource fairs within the two regions that I work in. And to give you an idea of the size of the region of Peel geographically, it's pretty much the same size as the city of Toronto. And the same thing um, with the region of Halton. The length of it is huge. Um, so we have two resource fairs that happen. We get anywhere from 50 to 80 agencies show up every year. It's got a more of a nonprofit focus. Um, and it's where families can just walk through for the day and um, gather information on what's available out there and how to access it and, and bring their kids through. Um, we've had, over the years it's evolved, we have a number of classrooms. So we do this in conjunction with the school boards. So they do scavenger hunts and different things like that to actually get the kids out there um, and um, finding out about the resources um, that would be most appropriate for them. Um, the Metro Links was, um, and I can actually forward this, um, we've developed provincial uh, um, document, um, and I only actually went to a few meetings for this. Um, it was um, developing um, transit training uh, uh, document for people using transportation of all different disabilities. And it did an audit of everything that was kind of uh, how, like throughout North America, there was a consultant that was hired through the ministry. So um, it's quite a, and I can forward that on or post it somewhere. I'll pass it to you, Lisa. Um, the, over the years, there's been about three or four different day programs. So I've kind of liaised with the adult agencies. The life program was one through the March of Dimes um, in Ontario, um, where it looked at kind of, um, we've got a group of youth um, where there's not a program available because they don't have a developmental diagnosis. How, how do we kind of develop a day program for them and what would that, and it has more of a vocational focus. So it's just looking at um, the different needs that are out there and um, uh, providing a resource that way. Um, the, the next one I, I'm sure everyone's familiar with was the transition uh, working group for the Provincial Council for Matero, uh, Maternal and uh, Child Health. Um, there's a number of minist uh, trying ministry and um, adding the Ministry of Health protocols and procedures for the for um, the province where we're looking at transition planning um, and it's developing a common language for transition planning um, through education, community and social services and um, I'm missing one off the top of my head education, community and social services and MCOIS the one that I'm a part of of course, that's the one I couldn't remember. And, um, and health is coming into that, um, but it's slowly but surely. Um, we also have the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement do a transition days. Um, also, just recently last week, I was at a meeting um, for the LINs, which are the Localized Health Integrated Network, and we're looking at developing a housing model for medically fragile, um, and this is for adults. Um, there isn't anything that really exists in Ontario. And, and what we're seeing is a, a lot of these young adults um, who didn't live are now living. So we, we, we need an appropriate um, uh, housing model that exists for those um, individuals. So it was very interesting being a part of that um, working group um, last week and kind of brainstorming around that with different service providers and, and bureaucrats. Um, future direction. Um, 
We are building, um, and if you look at our website, we're building three state-of-the-art um, sites. We have 10 sites, um, um, which is good, um, but not always good because we're always struggling to find space and whatnot. So the ministry is funding three state-of-the-art brand new sites, one in Brampton, one in Oakville, and um, one in Mississauga. So we also need to look at expanding youth programming um, within those areas and what will that look like and how will we staff them. So that's one of the things I'm working on right now. Um, I'm also looking at um, future collaborations with community partners. Um, and most importantly, my third bullet there is focusing on um, knowledge transfer. So how do we embed transition, the transition framework into all clinical pathways? Um, so just recently we've um, created, um, within my position, kind of the um, a clinical practice leader for transitions, which is, I, I think I'm considered that person right now. So um, it's going to the, all the clinical meetings and seeing how we can build um, uh, transitions for all families within all programs and what would best practice be um, uh, look like for them. So it's really interesting being a part of um, the um, literature review committee because uh, I'm learning lots and I feel like I'm in school. However, I tell families that I meet every day, I think I'm in school every day because I'm learning something new every day. Um, and then uh, developing a community practice is something I want to do at Erin Oak as well as it's wonderful being a part of this committee because I'm learning all about a community of practice. And um, it's nice because uh, at times within a large organization, and I, I, I'm sure some of you may um, be able to identify with that, you feel very isolated and alone. And, and I definitely feel that way, also being a male within this area. Um, so it, it's nice having that community of practice and running uh, 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 different things by people and making sure um, we're doing uh, and, um, the, the same thing. And it's just a, it, you're not alone, right? So uh, that's how I wanted to end this presentation. So I'm hoping some people have some questions for me because I really did run through that very quickly and I probably didn't say everything I wanted to say, um, but it was kind of the slides I wanted to put together for today. So I'm done. <laughs> people I, I just can you just move to our provinces um, yeah. it was incredible um, I think we should absolutely have questions from people because uh, that was fantastic you're doing so much and you work double full-time I, I work full-time and I have two children who are seven and nine I also have a little girl who is a G2 who has a condition called barter syndrome oh. so um, um, we do go down to sick kids um, sporadically. Wow. wow. So I take take it out to the group. Do people have questions for John? Um, could I just ask about the community partners that you're collaborating with? Are they Are such they as what you as had on the previous sheet? On the previous page? Are those some of the, uh, the committees that you collaborate with? Yeah, I, I actually was the chair of a few of the committees and I had to um, scale back some of my time because of some of the internal happenings within the agency. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I can give you a list. I can even send you the terms of reference if that's helpful oh, that for some of the one. committees. Yeah, yeah, we'd like that, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll eat it up together. Okay. So I guess I can just go through Lisa. Sure. Or I put my email on the front of the presentation. You can just email me directly and tell me what you want. And I'll do my best to answer questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. John, it's Kushamari um, speaking. I've heard you sort of explain this before, but maybe the rest of the group would be really interested in about how you kind of made a case for needing kind of to do this dedicated service from a transitions point of view within your organization. Because, I mean, from what I understood, you were a social worker by background and training. Um, it sounded like you had a supportive sort of supervisor and then kind of niche. I wonder if a little bit of a commentary on that might help other people who are trying to establish the same thing in their organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so if anyone's heard me at different community meetings before, uh, the biggest thing within research, and I, I don't know if it's articulated enough, 
Um, I know Helen Healy, um, who some of you may know, um, uh, it's very important that you have a senior administrator that um, supports what you do within the agency. So originally when I was hired in 01, I, I was hired by that, one of those people. Unfortunately, in the last five years, they've retired. Um, but I, I've tried to develop alliances through that work, which would support my work. Um, and that's the only way that we've been able to kind of um, um, move forward with a lot of this kind of work. And it's all about positive um, networking and um, making differences in families' lives. I'm not sure if I really answered your question, but um, it, it, it was not easy um, um, pushing transitions forward within our agency, um, especially within the growth and um, within the different um, priorities that are within our agency right now, because we expanded incredibly fast, um, very quickly. That didn't answer your question, or did it? No, oh, it did. It did. I, I've heard a part of that before. I'm just what I, I thought the rest of the group would actually really benefit from that as well. John, I know this might be. Um a question that's kind of specific, but I guess as I look at, this is Nancy from the IWK, that I look at building capacity within staff um, to kind of have some of these conversations around transition. You talked about um, doing a kind of uh, checklist, the internal checklist that you use with complex patients and that you would yeah. do it together with uh, a nursing staff. Yeah. At any point is, is the goal for the nursing staff to be able to do that independently or is it that you um, would, there would always be two staff doing that? Um, and and I just like for, for to yeah. I, some, some kind of um, where you want to go with that in the future and how you build capacity within the staff. Um, so this is a huge area that we have to look at in the future. Um, uh, right now, it works best if I do it with the nurse um, because their focus is more medically related and it's kind of, um, um, they've got the no a knowledge that I, I don't um, uh, completely have. I, I can't see it happening. I, I, there is a richness in the team approach, um, same with our site consultant who, site consultant who I work closely with. Um, I, I can tell you how I'm going to approach um, uh, building capacity in the future, but it's more among, uh, among therapists in the conversations that we have with families when they come through the center. Um, and then building capacities basically on what different pathways would look like for families so depending on, so letting staff know about the different pathways. Also, I, I mean, future directions would be having parent facilitators as well as youth facilitators, um, which Blurview um, ha, has done in the past and I think they're currently doing. Um, we need more of that and, and, and as a center we need to value that as well. I, I'm not getting back to your, I'm not, I'm not avoiding your question about um, the work that I do with our nurse. Um, but it, it, there is a richness in having the both of us um, meeting with families. Also, we've had a number of different therapists as well as community service providers take place within those meetings, and we, we have to have those people there um, um, to be able to put together a good plan going forward. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, thoughts from the group? I'm just, this is Lisa, I'm just uh, amazed at the amount uh, um, of work and the, uh, um, the programs that are taking place that I certainly wasn't aware of and the things, the things that are going on at all levels that are, are you know, they really depend on, on people like John and the rest of you t to keep this going. And I think this is um, it's a this has just been a great learning opportunity. All of us um, sharing these presentations, or all of you, I get I get to listen and learn from everybody. But um, I, I'm I'm sort of blown away by the amount of uh, the amount of work that goes on all around trying to support uh, these kids and families. So that's yeah, just my so comment. All these presentations are on the Ken under transition. Is that right, Lisa? 
Uh, yeah, we, we record all of these and we're posting them. And actually, um, Sam might be able to attest to this, but uh, when they were recently just uh, posted, um, it, it went out on Twitter and then it uh, became quite a big deal, all these uh, transitions programs. Uh, people were uh, coming to see them from around the country and around the world and, and talking about our about things that uh, we had posted. So. So, so if we do have a website, we can we connect directly to that Ken link where they are? Mm -hmm. Or do they? Yeah. Have to come I can show you. Them? I can show you. I'll, I'll show you this after uh, after we wrap yeah. up with this. I'll, I'll walk a bit through the Ken, and we'll look at everything that we have there. Can I just ask one question um, about your mentorship group? So, yes. your YAC. Can you explain? Just is your YAC? Does your Youth Advisory Council grow into your? Your mentorship group? Uh, do you have uh, a framework? Where are you at with that? Yeah, uh, every group, there's a whole whack of groups that exist throughout the province now, and we actually had a youth day. Andrea Morrison, who's on the phone, was there as well. But um, we had youth from all over Ontario come for that youth day. So our youth group, our youth group is um, um, only youth who are in high school. Um, so uh, up to the age of 19 or 21, depending on when they're finishing high school. And then um, um, we try to funnel them into our mentorship group, which only goes to the age of 25. Um, and then um, we have both groups kind of attend our different youth groups that function, and that's where we link individuals together. Um, we were having a lot of difficulty in the last five to ten years in how to link um, kids or youth with outside the center. We thought it was safer and made more sense to do it within our um, focused programming. Um, and if things happen outside the center, which happens between families, um, then we're really happy that that happens as well. So you actually buddy up a younger, um, yep. somebody under 19 with somebody over 19 and help them get yep. into the adult setting? Uh, not necessarily within the adult setting, within our youth programming. Okay, and whether they choose to, but do they buddy up by condition? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, it okay. could be um, both. Both are guys. It could be um, a common interest. It could be. Um, it, it really depends. Yeah, it's not disability focused at all, or diagnostically uh, focused. Okay, fantastic. And any problems? I know a lot of people are, you know, just with social media connecting up youth right. and that are <laughs> under 19 with someone over 19. D don't ask, because uh, oh. we had our drop in last night. Um, yeah, there's always something that happens through that. And I was just called into something at two o'clock where something was posted on Facebook from drop in last night. Oh, okay. So um, yeah, that happens and we deal with it. Deal with it. Um, we have Peel Police that does a annual presentation at our YAC meeting and we invite all of the different youth from the center to attend that. Um, we, we do that regularly every year, um, but yeah, uh, we have those dilemmas as well. Thank you for your honest answer. Yes. Well, can, I, um, can I add one thing that I forgot to say? Sure. Please. Um, uh, I also facilitate a uh, father support group, um, and it's been incredibly successful over the years. Um, and if anyone has the opportunity to do a group like that, um, it's well worth their time. Um, it adds to me as a person as well as a father, and I learned so much from the other dads. Um, I do it through email in giving the guys a reminder. I blind copy them. I have about 70 dads. Um, we get anywhere from six to 12 dads at a meeting, and um, it, it really adds to uh, the center. And uh, for example, we have a home and, uh, home and vehicle modification Saturday. The dads are coming to do the barbecue. So I'll get five dads to come in, and they'll do the barbecue for that day. So um, it, it's just it adds a richness to everything. So, our, our in other words, our moms groups and our fathers groups. They're really important, and we we talk about transition within our um, within both of those groups as well. Because I talk to a lot of the moms. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we just need to clone you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nine twenty. Oh no. my gosh. Yeah. Well, accolades Can I just from ask our group. John, wow. Have, have you ever thought, John, that you could travel around the country and help? different people get started. I mean, there's a certain skill 
to creating uh, these fresh committees, you know? Not everyone has that kind of skill. Have you uh, ever thought of that? Uh, have I thought of it? I, I've yeah. thought of it, but I have two young children, and yeah. um, I'm I'm a homebody. Um, <laughs> as much as I love what I do, which I really do love what I do, and I also get paid for it. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I'd love to do that, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's I, the beauty I'm, of our. Sorry, go ahead. That could be retirement planning, John. It's Elaine. There yeah. you go. Your transition. That's right. That's your next career. Yeah. Yeah. No, but this is the beauty of the um, the community of practice too, because people get to exactly. learn, and then you know people can reach out to John and get some uh, tips and tricks on uh, on how, you know what they can do. So. Absolutely. I have to tell you, um, what worries me the most is scaling back and going to more of an administrative level. Um, and not having the same impact with the number of families that I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that is what scares me more than anywhere and, uh, than anything because I, I, I firmly believe in my head um, that I'm good at what I do, but I, I can't see anyone else doing it. So I need to learn the skill of letting go <laughs> and having faith in other people. And, and if I can learn that, then I think I would be a better person. Uh, we've all oh heard that. Gosh. Yeah, we've all heard that one, though, and we, we all know people like that. I'm not naming any names. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and I think on behalf of the group, we can say, "Wow!" And these these presentations yeah. have just been so helpful. Um, and so I believe that anybody new that's joining the group, every time you come onto the calls, you're, you're gaining this this knowledge of what's going on around and around our country, and it's all good work. And we really have an open door policy. We want to be able to share all of this this information, and um, and then you know that all of all of this is being posted on Ken. Um, eventually, the tools will all be there. Uh, John, as well as Geraldine, put together a list for us that houses all of the programs. Um, and all of the tools and activities that they're doing within them. 